Hello and welcome. This is the Bits vs. Byte podcast. I'm your host, Amar Grigic, and today with me is uh, Quinten Schevenels. He's the CEO at Funda, and uh, he will be talking about all uh, what they do. And uh, Quinten, welcome. Thank you. Great to be on the show. And um, of course, uh, to start off, a little bit about your background and also how you got to Funda. Yeah. So uh, my background, in a nutshell, uh, over 15 years of executive experience, mainly in the Netherlands, within uh, digital media. Uh, I was the CEO of Layer, a augmented reality company, sold that company in 2014. Since then, I spent three and a half, four years as an angel investor, non-executive board member, uh, wrote a book that was a bucket list project of mine. And since last summer, I joined Funda in the Netherlands as their new CEO. Very cool. Uh, Funda is uh, very well known in, uh, in the Netherlands, as you, uh, as we talked about before we started. It's world famous yeah. in the Netherlands. World famous in the Netherlands, <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, but for the people that are listening that don't know about Funda, uh, could you tell a little bit about what you do? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, Funda is a, a real estate platform, as we call it. Uh, so you can compare that with like uh, Rightmove in the UK or Zillow in the US. Uh, what is a little bit uh, strange about us is that we have Two marketplaces. One marketplace is really focused on uh, consumers, so residential property, people that want to buy a house, sell a house. And the other marketplace we have is a marketplace completely focused on commercial real estate. So that's people like me looking for offer space if Funda is growing. And both are in their uh, market, especially in residential property. We have like a uh, Googleish market share market share google in search so that's like a super strong position yeah and in commercial real estate we're also the clear market leader but there's a little bit more competition out there mm. and um that that took a while of course and uh, you've uh, joined about a year ago so how, how was that process like for you to kind of start at this this company that's already established of course but yeah. um how 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 did that go so how what does that kind of flow look like when you start in this kind of a company yeah yeah, so of course, in this specific case, what was important for me also, given my background, was that for me, of course, the nice thing is not so much uh, being the guy who takes care of this company that is the clear market leader, because that's like a maintenance mode. Uh, but the challenge I see within Vanda is all the potential we have in the customer journey that is linked towards buying a house and at the end of the process, moving to the house. And there's like a lot of steps in that process. And we are only involved now in like the the searching, the marketplace part of that. So that's what I like a lot about Funda and the potential the company has. Uh, so that's the reason why I joined. Yeah, And how uh, what happens then if, if you join a company like this? Uh, yeah, you create your own onboarding program, right? Mm. Uh, so getting to know the business, getting to know the people, getting to know the customers, yeah. create your plan, your strategy, uh, check if the people you have in the company fit with that new strategy, and then uh, let's go. Yeah, and I can imagine that the first few months are really a lot. Uh, it would, Of course, a CEO always talks to, you, to the people on the, on the floor, but I can imagine that that kind of process was... Uh, kind of intensified in uh, in the first few uh, months. So, how did you go about that? So, uh, how do you know who to talk to and uh, who is the correct person to get you to further that role of CEO? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a, a good question. Um, so, what I always start with is that I like to meet uh, as much people, the people in the company, in my first week as possible. Mm-hmm. So we have about 130 people. So then it's really complicated to meet everybody one-on-one. But in my first week, I started my very first meeting with the HR director to talk about, tell me about the talent in the company. Tell me about the churn we have in people. Tell me about the employee satisfaction program to just get a feeling for that. And in the rest of that week, I had sessions, four-hour sessions with my direct reports to just get their thinking process, get to know them. We didn't do that at the office. We did that at my holiday house at one of the lakes here in the Netherlands to really get to know the people and the business. And then based on that, it's almost like a scrum process. Then I iterate and decide, so based on these conversations to who should I talk next week? Mm -hmm. 
and then within four weeks, including like reports, research, data, management decks, uh, then you have like, uh, I think in four weeks, you have like 80% of the stuff, you know it. Yeah. And then, of course, you need a lot more months to get like to the 90 and 100%. Yeah, well, one one thing in that, uh, in that kind of story uh, was interesting to me. So you did it in kind of a personal setting, right? Yeah. So it's not at the at the office. Was that, that was deliberate? I yeah, think. definitely. Yeah. Yes. But why was that? Um, I often like to do that. Uh, depending on on the topic and the objective of a meeting to either uh, move away from the office and uh, create a lot of time. So what I did was move away from the office. So that's more informal uh, and also have like half a day. So that means whatever comes up, you have the time to really talk about it. And it's not like you sit in the office after one hour, somebody's knocking on the door because there's the next meeting. Ah, yeah. yeah. So. And, and and I think it helps people get out of their shell, right? Informal setting will help people come out of their shell. And that's, uh, that's interesting to me because... Um, we don't think about it that it has that kind of an impact, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, being yeah. in a, in an office setting. So, and it, it, there's one thing to yeah, add to that. Sure. It, it, it's also an opportunity for them to get to meet me a little bit better, to get yeah. to know me a little bit better, because I'm very much aware that also I'm a little bit different in the office setting mm. than in such a uh, setting. I, mm. I don't believe it's a big difference, but it is a difference. Yeah, everybody has that. Yeah. Everybody is different in the office than in personal life, of course. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the market as well, because mm. that uh, that's interesting to me. The housing market in, in itself is interesting because... Uh, a lot of people are buying houses, right? So they have all kinds of low interest rates at the moment and everybody wants to do that. So h- how does that affect your your platform? So how does that affect uh, Fonda as a whole? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we help uh, real estate agents sell houses. We help consumers find the houses they want to buy. And in the market we currently have in the Netherlands, and this is, of course, the case in the most part of the Western world, is that there's a lot of tension on that market. So we have a market where it's really, really difficult to buy a house. Prices go up, interest rates are low. So what that means for us is that uh, a house that is uh, published on our website uh, is sold uh, on average between, I believe, uh, 51 days. Mm. If you would be looking at the center of Amsterdam, it's probably like uh, eight eight days. It's slowing down a little bit now in the center of Amsterdam, but still like eight days is crazy. So this is a very tight market. It's a uh, seller's market, uh, and we see that. So it means that we have less content on the website uh, because uh, it disappears very fast. So today we have, I think, a little bit over 100,000 houses for sale on the website which is like more or less the number of houses that are for sale in the Netherlands at the moment. But like four years ago, that was almost 250,000 houses. Mm, yeah, and that, the, the interesting part here is that a lot of these houses don't even come to market. There, there are a lot of houses that are just sold be- between real estate agents that just know each other, right? Yeah, yeah. less than 8%, luckily for us. Yeah, <laughs> but it, yeah. Does, it does feel sometimes like it is like that. I, I saw an article about that a little while ago yeah. where they were mentioning that like, okay, it really helps to have kind of a buyer or a real estate agent to buy a house right yeah so this was uh, there was some media coverage around that during my onboarding program so this was one of the things of course <laughs> where I thought like okay well wait that's interesting what's the trend here what's the impact or the opportunity for us yeah. so that's where with uh, some of the guys from business intelligence we spent quite some time to see what's happening here because we do have all the data about the market houses sold, also the houses that are not sold through our platform because most of the data is public data. And then you see that that percentage is flat over the years. So it's not really strange uh, uh, changing, but in the perception of people, it was changing. So yeah. it's something now we track it every month. Yeah, and that uh, that ma- makes sense. And that's also a good lead uh, to in, into the next question as well, because uh, uh, how uh, how could you as a platform maybe uh, play a role in t- into helping people find a, a new home, uh, even though the market is so scarce at the moment. So uh, how do you think about it? So how are, what are some of the things that you are thinking about to make that easier? Yeah, so, so uh, it starts with that uh, finding a house that is for sale uh, with our website is something we do really, really well. So 
there's not a lot I can improve there, right? Yeah. I think we have a lot of content about these houses, pictures, descriptions, search is working really well. So all the basic functionalities are in place. One thing we can improve a little bit more in this market is that we go towards like real-time notifications of houses that are for sale and that fit your profile. We will do that over the next week. So if we've been working on that, how to do that, that, that will be launched soon. So one thing we can do, which is a little bit more complicated, is help people um, find neighborhoods or houses that might not have a perfect fit with what they had in mind, because that simply is not available, but has a really good fit. So that can be that you're looking for a house in Haarlem, which is like a nice old city close to Amsterdam. But maybe if there's no house available for you there, the old part of Amstelveen, which is also a city close to Amsterdam, could also be interesting. Ah. But what's interesting to me there is that um, you, as we said, you're kind of the de facto standard in, in the Netherlands. And how do, you, how do you cope with that? Because I can imagine that when you're kind of the, the market leader, or uh, in many cases you are the market leader, or the market, <laughs> you can even almost, call that. Almost. Um, how do you... How do you deal with that? Because I can imagine that that kind of uh, uh, results in a kind of a laid back maybe attitude because you're already the market leader. So what, what are you going to do about it? So um, how do you cope with that? So how do you try and uh, influence that, that it doesn't become that kind of a, a situation? Yeah, yeah. No, this is, of course, and I think uh, uh, this is a risk for a lot of companies that are like very strong in their market. Uh, that it can become too comfortable. Um, and, and I think this is also one of the reasons why the supervisory board of Funda asked a guy with a profile like I have to, to join the company. Uh, so this is a lot about, I think, like uh, strategy, ambition, culture. Uh, of course, given the position we have, even if the site would be not like a really, really good site, but we have all the content, people would need to come to us because we have so much content more than anybody else. So uh, this is about creating an ambition in a company, a desire to move forward, yeah. to look where can you grow? Because in our current market, we can grow a little, but not a lot. So to also redefine your market and then build a team that really, really wants to go there. And then you move forward again. And continue to keep an eye on your customer. Because if you are very strong in the market, you run the risk that people start to look to the inside of the company and forget about the customer. Yeah, and how do you how do you get that information from the customer? That, that's a that's a big thing because I ask that a lot. A lot of people say, okay, you need to listen to your customer and uh, the way they're collecting feedback is so diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you do that? So we're improving that. So this is one of the key projects we're, we're running. One, one of the things we're really changing in the company. So we have a lot of conversations with customers, whether it's from customer support or the sales team, or sometimes we invite customers to come to the office or we do survey. Uh, but it is a little bit, uh, un until now, it was a little bit like fragmented. Uh, it was like a marketing department did some research or UX did a little bit of research. They don't really share it in a smart way, didn't really make it actionable. Uh, so that, that's really what we're changing now. So in Q1, we had a lot of groups of customers, real estate agents coming to the office, uh, not only to have drinks, but really to talk about their needs, how the market is changing, the role we play, what we can do better. Uh, yesterday, I sat down with the agency that helps us with testing usability, the needs of our users, looking at the consumers. So we're spending a lot of time now thinking about that, but I cannot say today that we're like really, really good at that. Yeah. I think within six to 12 months, we will be better at it. And that will also uh, be reflected in the products we ship, the marketing we do. I think, although we're a very strong company in our market, we can do better if you talk about customer satisfaction. Yeah, and that's the crazy thing is that um, you wouldn't expect that with, with a company that's already had that already has that market share, right? That kind of customer focus that you still need to keep because um, it. There are a lot of kind of examples where people uh, just. 
people in the garage just started something else mm-hmm. uh, as a as a kind of competitor or uh, rethink a little bit of uh, what they do and they just grow and surpass that kind of market leader mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot and that's always i think that's always the kind of danger to to being a market leader right yeah, yeah. Uh, there can be just someone that has a brilliant idea that you didn't come up with yeah <laughs> and you and you don't see them coming so the only thing you can do is try to do a really good job in just looking at the customers talking with the customers try to improve your product, maybe even reinvent yourself mm-hmm. and, and try to be that company yourself. So if needed, disrupt yourself. Yeah. Uh, but that is easier said than done. Yeah, and a, a pretty hard question here is that uh, what, what's kind of the best feedback that you got from a customer that you kind of all, already saw like, okay, we really need to implement that? Or is, is there something that yeah, comes yeah. to mind? Yeah, 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 yeah. This makes me smile because this is, uh, we, we sit now, it's it's Friday. So I, I had a, a week full of meetings. And one of the things that really stood out this week was that um, we had talks with real estate agents. And then one of the things out of these talks is that the team says, yeah, the agents, they all ask us for more data mm-hmm. since, since we have so much data on developments on the demand side, et cetera, et cetera. So we have data scientists and of course they have an idea what they could provide in data, et cetera, et cetera. And then we said, okay, so what exactly do they mean with data? <laughs> and then they say, we would like to have the email address of the people that are looking for the houses <laughs> we have for sale. <laughs> so that's what the customers talk about data. So yeah. This shows how important it is to really listen to the customer, ask the right questions before they say like, yeah, we want data. And then if you move to a data scientist, <laughs> oh, you'll get data. Yeah, yeah. But that was not what they meant. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, that's just an example where having the conversation with the customer and, and not only like do survey, yes or no, NPS, are you happy or not? Yeah. But also go into conversations with them and really try to find out what they like or what they don't like. Yeah. yeah. And, and this was the case with what, what I, I discussed before, like the real-time notifications. Yeah. Uh, people really have in this market the fear of missing out. So they're checking the website all the time. This is very nice for the number of page views. But at the end of the day, there's a use case. And with real-time notifications, we can solve that. And that might have a negative impact on the number of page views. But at the end of the day, that's not my end objective. So if that makes life easier for our consumers, our customers, to find that house and take that stress and the fear of missing out, reduce that, then that's great. Mm. And um, what what's what I would like to think talk about as well, because moving a little bit away from the marketplace and stuff like that, um, there's also something that was interesting to me is that you wrote a book. <laughs> yes. You, you mentioned that in the beginning as yeah. well. Um, and I would like to know a little bit about that as well and how that came about, but also... Uh, some of the things that you've learned by, while writing a book. I mean, that's that's pretty interesting to me. So yeah. could you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, so it started uh, when I sold uh, a layer. As I said before, uh, I decided not to stay with the company. Um, I made a little bit of money from that. Um, and then I thought, let's just uh, create a clean calendar and see what comes up and uh, one of the things i was thinking about some during the summer holiday maybe this is a really nice time to think if i can write a book or not because that has always been on my bucket list but i had no idea what the book could be about so i started this uh, this project started to talk with people uh, think about it and then i came to the point where i thought like i've been working in some corporate startups been doing a lot with scale ups so if i would write any book it w- would be about how does successful transition scaling up how does that look mm. Um, and yeah. maybe you could uh, tell a little bit about because there's a, a few tips within that within that book, of course, uh, yeah. about why. Uh, I think it, I haven't read the book. I want I want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to read it because I, I read a lot of books about this this topic, right? Mm-hmm. And there, I think there's a Built to Last, if I'm not mistaken, which yeah. is one of those books yeah. that also uh, um, covers that so, and why some companies become successful and why not yes exactly, uh, yeah. and that's a little bit the, the the stretch of your book as well right there it is, is yeah there yeah. are some tips in there as well so what are some of the kind of tips that you've uh, noticed uh, because you have that track record behind you yeah so uh, what, what are some of the key things why you think startups 
succeed and some uh, just fail. Yeah. So what, what I did for the book was, of course, go back to my own experience. And I really had the time to rethink that and like the things that happened and good decisions, bad decisions, start to talk with other entrepreneurs, investors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then what struck me is that there were like a couple of topics that popped up all the time in the book. I call them like the seven essentials. And in my opinion, those seven topics, if you want to be successful as a company, whether you're a corporate, a startup, a scale-up, you need to focus a lot on these topics. You need to do that really, really well. If you don't do it, you will not be successful. And one of them, and some are like open doors, uh, but it's really important to really like confirm the open doors and make sure if you run a company that you pay attention to it because the risk with open doors is that you underestimate them. So your question, uh, what stands out? I think one thing that really stands out is for successful companies to have a pay so much attention to developing a really good product or service and involve customers. You need to be really, really good at that hmm. uh, to be able to like overperform compared to all the others. The other one is like company culture. That's also like super important. And especially if you're scaling up a company, you're growing super fast. You need to pay a lot of attention, of course, to the talent, but also to, to the culture, how, how the team works. And those are like then, then two of the essentials I cover in the book. Uh, it's a very pragmatic book. So with a lot of examples from my own background, uh, Dutch companies. The book is in Dutch. Sorry yeah. for that. But um, yeah, that, that, that's what the book is about. And it might be something cool to do <laughs> yeah, in the no. future. Too. I, I'm too busy now. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. May, maybe a second book in a couple of years. Yeah. yeah. Th- the, that could be fun. Yeah, it is It is something that a lot of people ponder about, right? There, there are a lot of people that are thinking, okay, why why did this startup in particular win? Yeah. Or uh, it, 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 it grew and some just fell off, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of people uh, take the, the example of, uh, for example, MySpace and Facebook. How Facebook become became this whole powerhouse and how MySpace just went into oblivion actually yeah yeah uh, and uh, that that's interesting to me and uh, it's it's good that you mentioned culture as well because a lot of uh, a lot of companies forget about that right so they they say okay we need to focus on culture mm-hmm. and then they they think like okay that means we need to do more company retreats yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah and they can you can also make it like very vague holistic uh, yeah uh, and my, my my strong belief is that you need to make culture like very specific. What does it mean? What does it mean for behavior? What does mm-hmm. it mean for rewards? Yeah. What does it mean how we give feedback? On what topics do we do that? What does it mean for behavior examples of leadership? So make it super specific what you mean with that. Yeah. And then make sure everybody sticks to it and also implement it in the recruitment process. So there there might be really good people out there, but if they don't fit your culture, yeah. don't hire them. Mm. And that's like, I see that happen so many times, that mistake, and then don't do it. Yeah, and that's the, the no a-hole rule, right? <laughs> now, it, it is it is interesting because that uh, that's also something that I, I, I noticed as well and I talk to a, a lot of people about as well, is that... I, I don't care how good you are in that kind of a way, right? So in the kind of, okay, the work way. So mm-hmm. you need, I always say, okay, the work way I can probably teach you or you can teach yourself by just doing it, right? Mm-hmm. And just through experience. But the culture thing is is just something that you cannot change that easily, right? Yeah. Uh, people can change a little bit, but they're not going to overhaul their whole belief uh, no no and it's also where, where you should really question w- would you want that right mm-hmm. if you're just a person that doesn't fit the culture yeah poo, to change that change behavior maybe even change like some real strong convictions you have yeah, that that's not, not going to happen no you no. Sh- shouldn't even try that yeah and how, how would you describe the kind of culture that you uh, have right now at, at Fonda or is it is it kind of the culture that you expected it to be or how do you see that because I think that it's a hard question to answer but uh, yeah like no I, I don't think it's a hard question but maybe that is because I'm very much aware that this is super important so I think a lot about it yeah so I think the company when I joined was a company a uh, with a culture that's like uh, people really want to help each other. It's a very social company. It's uh, uh, young people, a lot of social events. Uh, they are really proud of Funda, the work they do, but also a little bit like comfortable. So not looking a lot at the data, uh, not too much thinking about the customer, internal collaboration, objective settings, yeah. mm, not so much. 
um, and, and that's one of the things we're really changing. So uh, where we are with the company now is is a mix of where we were and where I want to be. So yeah, this is really course. in transition. Logic. And it, uh, of course, that, that's a program we, we run. We defined the leadership foundations, how we call it. Uh, involve people with that, explain it, make it, as I said, I'm trying to do what I wrote in the book, right? Make it very specific, Uh, but it will be like more uh, customer focused, result oriented, more collaboration. Uh, And that also reflects in the changes in the company, getting some other people in, changing the structure of the company. So it's it's a, for the size of the company, only 130 people. It's like a Dutch company, successful company, but it's a big construction work. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, which which is like uh, requires a lot of uh, focus and attention for myself. Yeah, and the interesting thing here is that um, that that's something that uh, that I've noticed uh, a lot uh, that a lot of companies is that they don't have that focus on those specific points, right? Mm-hmm. So on being able to say, okay, we're going to make a decision now. We're going to change this and this, for example, in our platform, uh, and everybody's like, okay, but how do you know that will work, right? Mm-hmm. How do you kind of Prove that that will work, and that's the, that's one of the things I think you're re- referring to when you say looking at the data, right? You, yeah, you need yeah, to be- doing like simple stuff like uh, A/B testing, uh, really at the start of the process. Talk with five customers, ten customers, consumers. Invite them to the office. Sit down with customer support. What questions do they get? Yeah. So it's a lot of stuff you can do to 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 improve on that, and, yeah. and that's a lot of the things we are doing as we speak. Yeah, and one one thing to get back to that market, I, ha- I have one more question about that one because that just popped into my head as well. So, how do you see that evolving towards the future? Because you're, I don't know if you had prior experience in this kind of market, but. Um, did uh, what do you see uh, happening in that market, right? So how can, for example, technology change that market? Is there is there kind of avenues that you are thinking about that you can see? Okay, this is really going to impact that housing market yeah, yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yeah, there will be a lot of impact. Uh, the, it even has now a label. They call it like prop tech, and that's okay. then technology linked to the property market. Uh-huh. Um, I think uh, one thing is now um, valuations for houses or buildings. It's like a big thing. Mm-hmm. And it's often done by, uh, in, in the Dutch market, we saw, so we say like taxateurs. Uh, yeah. So often it's real estate agents involved. I think that is definitely a market where the algorithms will win. Uh, you already start to see that happening. So that will have a big impact on the industry. Uh, and I also think uh, buying a house involves a lot of uh, documentation, official documentation. So there, not like for the next two, three years, but definitely like between five and 10 years, yeah. I think blockchain will have a huge impact and will make life much, much easier for consumers and everybody in the ecosystem. Yeah. So for us, that's not something we are exploring now, but uh, I know for sure that that will also have impact on us and that we will be linking not to like a CRM system, but maybe to something in the blockchain, Mm. whatever it is. Yeah, and that's interesting that you mentioned that I had a podcast uh, before you as well, uh, which did go a little bit into this part as well. The the guest was uh, Pete Snakes. He's from uh, Mirabeau. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, talking about how... When we, for example, buy a house, we don't buy the kind of data that surrounds that house, mm-hmm. right? So it was like, okay, if you say, for instance, we have all this kind of sensory data later on around your house and stuff yeah. like that. And when you uh, want to transfer it, we don't do that right now, right? Mm-hmm. We give someone the key to a, a new house. Yeah, but yeah. there is all kinds of data surrounding that house that we just don't don't have right now yeah. or we we're not using at the moment and yeah. that no and currently we're like uh, we add to the website that you know uh, what kindergartens are there yeah. and into what uh, tennis club you can go yeah and that's already like valuable data but sure. yeah yeah over the years you can take this like to any level you want because there will be so much more data the question is a little bit similar to the example i gave about the real estate agent talking about the data meaning the email address mm. for me it's always like uh, data yeah fine but why what do you want to do with yeah, it the value yeah, because there, there's like so much data now and this will become even more and more in the years to come. But what to do with it, right? I'm not so much interested in data. I want to have like use cases, insights, actionable insights. That, yeah. That's what I'm really looking for. Yeah, what, what are we going to change based on that data and what what's the thing? And he was talking about it. He was referring to it like a little backpack of data that you can uh, get while, while you buy a new house, right? Yeah, so, a backpack in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it could be data that's not available right now. So uh, what is the state of, uh, for example, 
uh, you could have sensory data about uh, uh, well water pipes within the house, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, how, or in the street, or yeah, 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 yeah. What's the kind of data around that, right? When was the last maintenance, or some kind of things? And yeah. th that's all data that we sometimes have right we know uh, what for example if you have the the heating or whatever we know when it was for example purchased a new uh, boiler or whatever right? yeah yeah uh, but we don't know all that kind of other stuff because we don't we don't measure it at yeah. the moment but yeah. that's something that yeah for definitely example, yeah and that could be super valuable content for yeah. us if a house is for sale to add that content to the website so people get that information not not only when they would buy the house, but also up front. So yeah. they know uh, exactly what's happening in the house in the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. us, of course, the, the real big thing, uh, and we, we only touched on it briefly, is like we're, we're a super strong marketplace. Uh, the growth opportunities for us, redefining the market, is going down the customer journey, becoming a platform. And that's for us starting to think about the role we can play in mortgages, notary services, yeah. insurance, energy moving services yeah uh, that's for us like the big thing that's where our moonshots are that's why we created a team working dedicated on strategy and business development uh, building stuff maybe partnering maybe maybe doing some acquisitions but for like the next three to five years i think we can add a lot of value in that customer journey because it's very fragmented now yeah people often are unhappy about the the people that play a role in that process so i think uh, there's an opportunity for us to explore if we can change that yeah that's going much broader than just providing a platform where you can find a house right that's, yeah yeah yeah. That's, yeah that's actually um as you said adding that value based on the data that you already have and that's yeah. that's and, and the really trust important. we have also from yeah. from consumers right based on the user experience they have the way do we do that uh, and we're right at, at the start of, of the customer journey. So if, if you're at the end and you want to move to the start, that's really, really difficult. Mm. I believe it's easier to go from the start to the next step and the next step. So uh, yeah, that, that's that's the really exciting thing, in, in my opinion, to, yeah. to get the company ready, the people ready, the culture ready to move in that direction. We're like financially a super healthy company. So yeah. we, we can have the resource. If we have a good plan, we have the resources. Yeah, and the, the, the good thing as well, as you said, a lot of people see it as a good brand as well. I mean, yeah. uh, me, myself as well, if I hear, hear the name, it, it, it kind of sounds positive right yeah. no <laughs> it does it does and this is of course very funny if i uh, uh, uh talk about if i go to like uh, an event or reception or yeah. a birthday party yeah. and then often you meet new people and they ask what do you do and i talk that i'm working at funda everybody has an opinion on it yeah. uh, almost like 99 percent is like super excited and positive um, and that's not a lot of brands that have those really like positive vibes. Yeah. Uh, and, and for me, that's really nice. But for me, that's also just like business potential. That's an asset. And we should really uh, use that to add more value. Yeah. So to wrap up, I mm -hmm. have one more question. Yeah. Um, it's the hardest question I always ask at the end. <laughs> oh, gee, oh, gee. <laughs> ah, well, it's not that hard. But um, you started a, a year ago. So what are you most proud of uh, since you started? So what, what are the kind of things that make you proud uh, in this kind of almost a year that you're working at Fonda? Yeah, not proud yet. So that would be my <laughs> first time. No, it's really too early to call sure. for that, to be honest. Sure. Uh, sure. But we, of course, there there are some milestones that are really important. And I'm really happy that we got to these milestones. So that's, for instance, uh, we defined a new strategy. Uh, when we did the employee satisfaction survey, people are really excited about that strategy. So that also Very has cool. to do with like culture. So it's not like the strategy from the new CEO. No, it's really like people see that they want to go there. So I think that's a very important milestone. And also some changes in the company, in, in, in the team, the people that report to me. And I think that's also a very important milestone because as I said, culture is important, talent is important. That starts with the leadership team. And I have the feeling now that I have the team that is ready to go on this journey. Um, so no, may maybe in two, three years time, I'm a little bit proud. I'll ask you but again. <laughs> yeah, not, not yet, not yet. I'll ask you again in yes, a year. <laughs> yes, you're more than welcome. Uh, so how can uh, people find uh, Funda and uh, yourself as well on the internet? Yeah, so Funda is uh, funda.nl. Yep. Uh, even if you would Google uh, House Amsterdam we're You'll probably, probably on top <laughs> anyway uh if they want to find me uh at quinton that's with two 
Eyes. Yep. Uh, 24, that's uh, uh, my Twitter account. Yep. But also Quinten Schevenels is a pretty unusual <laughs> name. So I yeah. think if you put that in Google, nobody else goes by this name. So no, then I, you I will tried find it. me. I yeah, tried yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only one I think. Yeah, eh? yeah it's only one crazy guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you a lot for your time, uh, Quinten. It was uh, very good to, to talk to you. And okay. uh, also uh, for the listeners, of course, you can find the Bits vs. Byte podcast on uh, bitsvsbyte.com. And we're we're on all uh, major podcasting platforms and of course Twitter, uh, Instagram and on LinkedIn. It's all bits vs bytes. And I would like to thank you for listening and until next time.